What's going on guys? I hope you're all doing well. It is cold as holy balls in the UK at the moment. So I thought I'd do a video telling you about my uh, some sunnier, warmer times in my life. Uh, and that is when I did the cruise ship gig. Uh, a couple of guys have actually messaged me recently about this. So um, shout out to Pat and Jens. I hope your, uh, I hope your decisions have been made on that one and uh, it's all going well. Um, so I'm going to tell you as much as I possibly can about my experience and what the job entails, what gear to take, the audition process, the reading thing, the living conditions, the kind of pay, would I do it again, that sort of thing. And it might be a bit of a long one, so I'll put the chapters at the bottom so you can uh, come back to it and look at different bits. But first off, um, I did it for three years, I believe, from around 2011 to 2014. So things might have changed slightly now, but I can tell you my experience and how the gig went. I imagine the gig is probably the same. Maybe some of the pay might have changed or some of the roles might have changed slightly. But so uh, yeah, 2011 to 2014, I went through uh, an agency called ProShip. Um, I think they might still be around. They're based in Canada. Um, so I'll get onto the audition process in a minute. Um, I worked for three, three different cruise lines. I worked for Carnival for a little bit. I worked for Princess Cruise Lines for a little bit and then Celebrity. And I think they kind of do cruise ships a little bit like hotels. So you might have like a two star hotel or a three star or a four star uh, and so on. So I think, I think Carnival was kind of the sort of lowest uh, and then maybe Princess and then Celebrity or maybe they're about the same. But one thing you'll, you'll if you get into this kind of thing or you do these kind of jobs, one thing that will crop up, a little bit like things like Coca-Cola uh, and other sort of companies, is there's all these different cruise lines, but a lot of the time they're owned by the same company anyway. So Princess, I think, is owned by Royal Caribbean, and uh, there's a few other that are kind of owned under the same umbrella. The audition process, let's get into that. So as I said, I went through a company called ProShip, based in Canada. So this was 2011. I believe I did the audition. So I applied online through their website and it being 2011, Zoom wasn't really a thing. Skype was kind of a thing, obviously, but, but the way things are done now, Zoom wasn't really a thing. The pandemic hadn't happened and Zoom stocks, you know, hadn't gone through the roof. Basically applied on the website and then they got in touch saying, oh cool, we'd like to arrange an audition. And the way the audition worked was they call you they give you a time, so say 4 p.m. They call you and say, right, we're going to send materials through and then we'll see you in an hour. So 4 p.m. rolls around, they give you a phone call and say, cool, 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 this is this, this is that. Can you confirm that you've got the things that we sent you? So they send you an email to like a, a kind of a G Drive or a Dropbox kind of thing. And you download some tracks, you download some charts, and then you've got an hour until they call you back and you, you, when I did it, obviously Zoom is a thing now, so it won't be the same. You can record calls and stuff like that. I had to be on the phone, but also recording the interaction on a camera. So like an audition tape, basically. But you're on the phone, so then they can talk you through and you can kind of react. So, it's, so they know it's live, if that makes sense. So they send you all this stuff through. You have to print it off. You have something to play the backing tracks. You have your music in front of you. You have your camera set up and they're on the phone. So from memory, what the, the different charts that they sent and backing tracks, it was, there was like a kind of um, show band type thing. So much like a, like a theater show type um, music. So if you've done any kind of like Amdram stuff or like kind of West End kind of things, it'd be something like that. So it'd be something that was mainly chords, a couple of little lines. And then the thing that they sent me, he said on the phone, there's like, there was like a really fast, like two beat, um -cha, um -cha, um -cha, um -cha, kind of thing. And there was a, there was a couple of hits, like um -cha, um -cha, um -cha, um -cha, ba, 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 um -cha, um -cha. And he said that was kind of like a bit of a deal breaker. So I got sent that, I got sent what they called a cocktail chart, like a cocktail party chart which I think at the time, I hadn't heard this prior to, to this interaction. Um, it's basically like a, like a jazz standard, but with very specific voicings. So he said, the voicings on there, they, 
they're specific, you really want notes. So if it said, you know, sharp nine, sharp five, he wants those notes want to be in there. So you've got to kind of really get the extensions in on that one. As opposed to another chart that he sent, which was just like a lead sheet. And uh, that was like more of a, so the other two are more reading. The lead sheet thing was more kind of, can you just sort of play this melody, do a bit of kind of comping and then take a solo. So that was to sort of check a bit of improvisation and a bit of reading as well. So these are with tracks. So you get counted in and then you're off. I thought there was another one that was more like a sort of funk thing as well which is a little bit more, it's like a, a combination of things that are quite explicit. So figures and hits. So you've really got to, you know, really got to kind of nail what's on there. And then stuff that's a bit more open. So it was just kind of chord slashes and, you know, they, they, they're kind of trying to see as, as many different sides to you as possible by giving you this stuff. So these things are on track. You get a count in, you get a click, and then you go and you just sort of try and read it in front. You've got an hour to kind of very briefly get set up and look at this stuff. But by the time you've got everything loaded up and downloaded and printed off and all that kind of stuff. They send it to you at four. If you, I mean, I didn't, but if you have printer problems in between four and five, you're pretty screwed. Yeah, you get a click in and then the way they did it is you had basically two tries. So kind of scan over it, you know, maybe kind of check positions or do what you need to do. Any little, look for any little problem parts. So he kind of talks you through on the phone to be fair and he says, watch out for this at, you know, bar 39 or whatever. You get one go and then the second go, they'll talk you through it afterwards and be like, cool, cool, cool. Oh, maybe you missed that. Or that could be a bit more, you know, you could hit that a bit better. And then the second time, they're basically looking for progression. So if you made a little error or you missed something the first time, they're kind of looking for you to, looking, looking for you to kind of amend that the second time um, and make sure that there is progression there. So it's just better the second time, basically, which I guess is sort of trying to emulate a bit of a, rehearsal scenario and then the show so you read through these different things and he talks you through it and then there was like a i think it was like a jazz blues as well at the end it was like a little backing track they just want to see how your improvisation is because they do ask you that do you improvise because i think there's there's perhaps some people that go in there that are more readers and maybe they don't improvise as much but again they're trying to just see get a full picture of what you can do um as well as that so that's all the kind of reading reading thing and i'll get to the reading the the sort of the elephant on the page, as it were, the sight reading thing in a moment. But as well as that, so that was the kind of the audition process, you know, you send that off. But as well as that, he asked me to do, to film like a short kind of 10, 20, 30 second clips of as many different kind of styles, guitar style type things as possible. So by that, I mean, maybe like a sort of finger picking, sort of like Blackbird type thing some kind of Motown sort of chank two and four kind of things, maybe some kind of solely single line sort of Jimi Hendrixy kind of stuff, maybe some, basically whatever you've got, like maybe some sort of neoclassical type thing, maybe like a Stevie Ray Vaughan kind of shuffle. As many different things you can think of, maybe like a reggae thing, as many different things you can think of, little snippets like that to put together for more of the pop side of things. So you've got the reading side and then more of a pop side of thing. Because the, the gig I was, 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 doing or was going for was kind of more of a sort of more pop based but with the reading involved as well however that's not entirely what it was uh which i'll get to in a bit so the reading thing you will have to be able to read to do a gig like this Just, i mean if you manage to get as far as getting on a, con a contract without really being able to read you are being deep water as it were very very quickly now, do you need to be able to read uh, fly excrement at 100 paces? Um, no, you don't need to be that good to get by. However, yes, you do need to be able to read. You won't see a single scrap of tab. You'll see chord charts and things like that, but you definitely will be called upon to sort of, you know, be picking out melodies and stuff like that. And I'll go over the the different kind of roles and the different gigs and, and things that were required a little bit, a little bit later on. So yeah, the reading thing, you would definitely want to get on that because you, you would not uh, sort of survive otherwise. I would say, you know, 80, 90% of it is kind of doing the rhythm thing. Um, but yeah, you do need to be able to read single notes and melodies and, and written rhythms as well. The most intense kind of reading part, I would say, of the whole kind of experience would probably guest entertainer stuff because 
they're just flying onto the ship that day. You have a rehearsal at four and they just give you the music then and there. And you've got maybe 10 minutes while things are getting set up and you know, they sound checking mics or if maybe if they play an instrument, they're sorting that out to kind of quickly look through and be like, oh, right, is there anything severe in here that might catch me out before going? The other stuff, like say there's a production show, that might you might join the ship on a Monday and that might be on a Thursday. So you can kind of look at that and those have tracks most of the time anyway. So, you know, you can kind of get away with it because there's a lot of sort of sweetener, if you like. So you're kind of playing along to stuff that's already there anyway but you've got a bit of a heads up on that. Or maybe if the MD is kind of organized, he will say, you know, send out the set. Here's the set for, you know, tonight. You might send that out in the morning and then it's up to you. You'll have like a big book and then you sort of pull all the parts out. And then if you wanted to, or you needed to, you could kind of look at it sort of in the day before you get there. But yeah, the sight reading thing will catch you out if you're not careful. So let's say, you know, you've done the audition, that all goes well, you get the gig. I believe the agency I use, they kind of give you like a score based on how your, your audition went. And when a job comes up, the higher your score is, it's kind of the sooner you will get a call. So if you score really low, but you still like pass, if you like, there might be eight guys that would potentially get offered work before you, you know, in order to get the contract. And every time you do a contract, you kind of get like a review from from the people uh, on board anyway, and they sort of feedback. So once you're in, you're kind of in, but that's kind of, as far as I know, it might, again, it might be different now, but as far as I know, that's kind of how that went. So you get the gig, actually getting to the ship uh, is another thing. So the way it works for me is the company, the agency and the company, they all paid for like flights and accommodation and that. But the thing they didn't pay for, and this is what you'll have to do anytime you, you, you're going for one of these gigs, is get a medical done. And they were kind of pushing for, like the, their recommended one was on, I think Harley Street in London, which is like expensive medical street. And I'm not saying they were doing this, but you know, people think, oh yeah, England, London, it's only like, it's only 10 minutes away. So you'll have to go and pay, you know, perhaps around 300 pounds, maybe more in order to get a medical done. And it's got to have a certain amount of things done. So basically they want to know that you're not joining the ship with any kind of pre-existing condition, or if you are, that that is taken care of because obviously the medical side of when you're in the middle of the ocean is a little bit more kind of limited, if you see what I mean. And if you're over a certain age, I think that's supposed to include like a chest X-ray as well. If you're, if you're a man over, maybe like 45 or something. I think they require you to have a chest X-ray as well as all the other medical stuff. Um, you know, and you gotta get a certificate signed off to be like, you know, I'm, I'm fit for work. I'm not joining the ship with any kind of heart conditions or anything. I'm not gonna get on there and be an insurance nightmare is basically what we're looking at. So you gotta get medical done and then they will arrange flights and accommodation. The way I did it is I flew out to a port. So the first ship I joined was out of Alabama of all places. First time in America, and it was Mobile, Alabama. Oh, so they fly you out there, and then you they tend to put you in a hotel overnight, and then you join the ship early the next day. And you usually end up sharing a room with someone, because if there's multiple people joining a ship on the same day, you do that. Join the ship, and you have to go through loads and loads of admin, and then training, and all sorts of things uh, when you actually sort of get there. Which, when you first join, is a nightmare, because uh, it's like safety training up the wazoo. There's one that you have to do every time you join a ship, even if you've done it before, uh, which is like a basic safety thing. It tends, it's, it tends to be stuff to, to do with like, what do, these, uh, what do these kind of codes mean? Or what does this mean if the ship horn goes a certain amount of time? What happens if this happens? What happens if that happens? What fire extinguisher is for this or that? You have to do that every time. After you've done a few contracts, if you're with the same company, once you've done like, a, like I've got a, I don't know where it is, but I've got a certificate somewhere in crisis management. <laughs> so if you're ever in a crisis, I'm your guy. But that would carry on to another ship then. So you've got proof to say, look, I've already done this training and I don't need to do it again. If you first join, that will come up quite a lot and it does get quite annoying because a lot of them are you know, at the crack of five, 6 a.m. Um, especially when you first join, that's sort of like a really early start. So there'll be all that to do. Now, let's talk about gear before we get onto the different jobs that I had to do. Obviously, getting on an aeroplane and traveling with guitars, as we all know, if you've done it before, is an absolute nightmare. So I just took 
one guitar, a couple of leads, power supply, and at the time I had a, a Nova system, like the little the little red guy, which was great. You know, small, compact. Obviously, there's these things like the quad cortex and things like that out now, but definitely some sort of multi effects, I would say, because you don't really know what you're going to be playing until you get there. And if it's something that really does require the sound, you know, you can't really rely on whatever amp is going to be on the ship at the time. I think there's probably a lot of um, sort of like Fender Hot Rod Deluxe kind of things knocking around from 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 memory. But basically, don't expect like a, a sort of high end sort of thing. It's usually like a decent clean up and then you're expected to kind of bring whatever else you need. Now, you've got to kind of travel light, really. You know, you can't be taking, I mean, you can try if you want, but you can't really be taking like three guitars and like a massive pedal board because you've got to take enough stuff to live as well. So multi-effects, ideally as small as you can kind of handle it really, that will cover everything you need. And then a guitar that will do most things. I actually took this. Um, I took this Strat. I dug this out the other day. This is, this is a <laughs> Mexican Strat that I bought off a friend a very long time ago for perhaps two, maybe 300 pounds. But I have definitely spent way more than that on it, um, just kind of tricking it out. You'd be like, why the hell has he put a P90 in a Strat? Well, I wanted to take one guitar that would try and do as many things as possible. And I put that in there to kind of like try and do the jazz thing. And it's all right, do you know what I mean? It's got. It's got a little push, push, push thing on there. And then it's got like a little, uh, I think that's like a blower switch. Oh no, it's, it's not a blower switch. It splits this, um, splits this single coil, uh, splits this humbucker, sorry, here. I'll do a proper video on this at some time. But from memory, there's like 11 different ways you can have these pickups. I changed the bridge on it. It's got like a Wilkinson blade, blade runner, blade runner bridge. Um, it's got like a little roller nut on there. Shout out to Jeff Beck. <laughs> Um, none of these are stock. I think the scratch plate is not stock either. The tuners are, the neck and the body are. Oh, and obviously it's got a travel now in the back. All you guys, you know, from the hot days of 2006, 2007 YouTube will know where that comes from. Um, but yeah, I took this, took that to kind of do most things, you know, it'd do the rock thing, it can do the jazz thing. You played a lot of kind of soul and Motown stuff. It kind of covered a lot of bases. So I took that, took another system that pretty much covered everything. I think at one point I had to do solo sort of jazz melody, you know, chord melody kind of things in a, in the atrium, which is like a kind of hotel lobby. And when I was out there on one particular ship and I was out there for quite a while, I think there was a guitar center not that far away from the port. So I bought a uh, sort of cheap Ibanez uh, not not that one in the back. That's uh, that is an old Ibanez from the 1970s. I bought like a sort of cheap Ibanez kind of hollow body thing to sort of do that. Then you're getting back with two guitars, and it's like. Whoa. So, that's gear. You probably will have to take like a, if you've got a suit, you have to take a suit, um, nice shoes. You know, basically anytime you're in guest areas, you've got to be dressed a certain way. So you need a suit and you need kind of shorts, t-shirt, you know, that kind of thing. So you have to kind of really figure out the pack because you can't be taking loads and loads and loads. Or if you do, you'll have to pay extra. And you know, who wants to be doing that? You're going there to do a job. You don't really want to be paying. So right, the different roles. I went out there as a show band guitarist. So that was my job title at the time. That has, I believe, has since changed on some ships to utility guitarist, which means you're not necessarily in the show band, which is kind of the reading kind of orchestra musicians. They all join separately and get put in a band together, as opposed to like a, a party band, which is like a sort of function band that all join at the same time. Utility guitar player, utility guitarist means they can basically just call on you for whatever they want. So say somebody's getting married on the ship and they want someone to just play you know, just play some kind of solo melody sort of arrangements while they're walking around or like while they're having drinks. They'll ask you to do that. Or I've done like a couple of wine tasting type things on there as well, where I was doing that sort of thing. So it's basically, you know, they could ask you to do anything. I will say this now, if anyone's kind of thinking about doing this sort of thing in preparation, anything you've got in your toolbox musically will probably get used. You know, if you have like a niche thing that you do, they might be like, oh, that's cool. You can use that in this or go and do a solo set or maybe go and do a trio set. Basically, there's the, the, the guy in charge, the MD or the 
cruise director who's kind of in charge of entertainment will have different slots that they'll have to allocate. They'll have the show band, which will do things like guest entertainers, um, the production shows, although that might have changed slightly now. Uh, they'll do jazz sets, big band sets. You get moved around all these different places. Then there'll be like a party band, which is like a function band, like top 40 kind of thing, that will be in one lounge and they'll move around. There'll be like a kind of coffee shop, singer songwriter type thing, maybe singing covers, maybe doing some of their own stuff. They'll get moved around. There'll maybe be a piano, piano bar guy. Some of the ships I was on also had uh, like a band from the Philippines, like a Filipino band. They would do their bit. So there's lots of different things that are going on in different places. So if there's a slot to fill and everyone else is busy, it might be like you as a guitar player or the show band pianist that will have to go and, you know, they'll just throw something together. So if you want to play, it's there, you know what I mean? You can put yourself on and do that kind of stuff. So main duties with the show band thing was working with the, the show band orchestra, if you like. So that would be either, depending on the ship, five piece, seven piece, nine piece, 10 piece, maybe. What tends to happen, uh, especially on the first couple of ships I was on, is there would be a show band that was, like I said, either five piece or like five piece and a couple of horns or three horns, and then a singer. And depending on what you were doing, if it was, you might have to do like a party band type set, like a wedding function thing, but with charts, you know, you decide on a set and then you kind of do that at one time. Another time it would be, maybe the singer has a night off, so you just do a jazz set, which would just be like lead sheets, like from the real book. And then people taking solos and you pretty much just talk through who's got the melody and maybe how are we going to end it. So if you're, you know, if you're into the jazz thing, that's a good opportunity to play. You've got big band sets, which are more dance, dance sets, if you like. So big band charts, which take a look, if you haven't really seen that kind of chart before, they're quite old school. They take a little bit of fathoming, um, depending on how they're written. Because the big band guitar sort of role, you have to do a sort of, quite a bit of a uh, long division. So you'll see all these, it'll be like all these kind of chords in one bar, but if you're sort of smart about it and you're very quick to look at it, it might be, you can just play two notes that just weave all the way through the middle and then everybody else kind of does all the, the extensions and moves around you. So those can be quite fun because you're just sort of doing the rhythm part. You know, you're not trying to like shove all these different chords in. What else? Oh, ho ho ho, live band karaoke, which is also called um, bandioke, I think over here, or it might be somewhere, you know, you might've heard that sort of where you're from. Yeah, live band karaoke was one of the things I got introduced um, when I was working for Carnival. Now, it's kind of either, it was really fun, and you know, amazing depending on who signed up, or it was an absolute nightmare. Now you don't really know what's gonna happen, but to be fair, some of that was probably the more difficult read because some of the tunes that are being called, they're not really made to be written out like that. So for instance, I actually got away with it. Nobody, nobody called it while I was on there. So I kind of got away with it. But Jump by Van Halen was in this list. So you've got this book. When I was there, it was sort of first got installed. So there was like 150 songs and then they added to it every now and again. They'd get the arrangements or get the rights or whatever they need to do and like make the tracks with uh, backing vocals or whatever they need. So it takes a bit of time for them to add new stuff. So it's probably, you know, 300 plus or even more songs now. But Jump by Van Halen was in there. And seeing that written out, in standard notation, you know, like all these notes, like jumping around and then a big bracket over the top with 11, like, oh yeah, cool, I'm gonna sight read a big, you know, 11 notes in the space of four or whatever, was horrendous. Or you'd see things like um, ACDC tunes and it's like, you know, big G's written out in standard notation, like G, 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 <laughs> like that, or A, 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 D, D, G. But that, some of that was like a more difficult read if you didn't know the songs, some of the pop songs. But again, that is something that, you would know, right, it's live band karaoke on Friday night or whenever. So, you know, you could practice your reading or just take a look at some of the songs and go, oh, that's a bit awkward before then. Um, but the way that worked was people, there would be a karaoke host, there'd be a guy, uh, he would tout for talent and get people to sign up. They have a book where they've got the, you know, the names of the tunes in it. And they'll pick a tune and then there's a sound engineer that would be kind of queuing all this up. The drummer has in his, and the drummer will get one, two, and then he counts everyone in, one, two, three, four, and then you're in to the chart. And the reason it's done that way is so that the lyrics on the screen line up with the person that's that's singing. And then there's a, if there's a track with backing vocals on there, like like Jump Around was on there, it's like House of Pain. Um, so that like, <laughs> that was on the track, because obviously you can't really, unless you're like Tom Morello, 
you can't pull that off live. But yeah, you count you in and then you go and that's, it all kind of lines up. Now and again, you get somebody that missed the, in, the entrance and you'd have to restart because everything lines up, everything, the band lines up, the drummer lines up, the charts line up, back and track lines up. So yeah, that was, that's fun when it goes well and there's good people that get up. But sometimes if it, it can be a bit like, oh. but yeah. That's one of the jobs. Mention big band set, big band sets, dance sets, function. Guest entertainers, right? Guest entertainers. They are potentially the trickiest ones, or potentially a night off, depending on who it is that turns up. So guest entertainers can range from violinists, um, singers. You know, a lot of people that used to do big kind of roles on like Broadway or the West End. So you know, maybe they were like um, like Mufasa for, on the opening run of The Lion King musical and they'd have a bit of a story and they'd talk about different shows they've been in and it's, it's like they put a whole show together and then it's interjected with songs and stuff like that. Um, so they will bring the charts on and they will fly on in the afternoon, you have a rehearsal in the afternoon and then a show that night. So that's super high pressure really, that's probably the most high pressure part of the gig I think because you don't know what the guest entertainer is going to be like and you have to bear in mind that they'll fly on for a day, they have to do this rehearsal, they don't know what musicians they're gonna get. They've just been flying around, they're giving the music out, they've rehearsed this stuff God knows how many times before because it's their stuff, it's their show. So they can sometimes be a little bit, I don't wanna say rude, but just a little bit impatient and they're just like, you know, let's just get on with it. So you just need to make it work. You need to make what is on the page into music as quick as possible. So that can, like I said, singers, violinists, piano players. There's a there's a couple of times where the actual guest entertainer was a guitar player. One time, a couple of brothers came on and did like a like a Beatles kind of tribute thing. So I just got the night off, which is great. It's like, well, we play guitar. We don't, you know, we don't need guitar on this. But then obviously, other times where, you know, you kind of you're quickly looking through and you turn a page and it's just sort of chromatic 16th notes kind of doing this. You're like, oh my God, right, okay. You have to get it together uh, then and there. If it's somebody that knows, if it's somebody that's, that's, that's patient and knows their show, they will know where the problem parts are. And they might just go, let's just top and tail that one because they, they've done it lots of times before and there's no issues. Or let's look at that one because there's an awkward part in it. Or it's written in a certain way and I haven't got it rewritten yet, so let's just go over that. Those are the best guys. The people that know how to talk to musicians and, uh, and, and get, the, get their kind of get their charts to turn into music as quick as possible. Those are the better ones. And people will know if you are, if there's a guest entertainer that is an absolute nightmare to work with and is perhaps a bit of a, a bit of a diva or has a bit of an ego, you will know about it. You'll be like, oh, this, this person's coming on, right? You got make sure you are on it on the day. Or, you know, this person's great on the, on the other hand, you know, th that kind of stuff troubles. And after a while, you might end up playing someone's show more than once, so you kind of know what to expect. Sometimes they'll make a feature of you, so they'll want you to come out and, and like do a solo or something. So I'll be prepared for that kind of thing as well. So the, the, the kind of solo guitar thing, I didn't really have much of that in the bag when I went out there. I would have been about 23, um, and I haven't really spent much time kind of getting any sort of arrangements together. And I wasn't at the level where I could just kind of read it and make, you know, on the day from a lead sheet and kind of make it passable. Um, you know, I feel like not, I feel like that, that makes a bit more sense on piano because you, you know, you've got 10 fingers and a pedal. So you can kind of, you know, it's easier to, to not have dead air. Whereas on guitar, as soon as you kind of lift something up or you lose a bass note, it's sort of, you know, you've kind of got to be on it. So if you are thinking about doing this kind of, kind of gig, I would maybe see if you could get half an hour to an hour maybe of solo kind of arrangements that you could just sit in the corner and sort of play BGM, background music, just sort of pretty, you know, pretty stuff. I think what I did actually did was I had a few arrangements that I did and I basically went through it almost like a set list and I said, right, I'm going to have a couple of Latin things, I'm going to have a couple of ballads, a couple of swing things, a few pop tunes, I did some Beatles tunes, but I cheated slightly and when I got the Ibanez kind of arch top thing, I mentioned there was a guitar center. I got a loop pedal as well, which if you have a multi-effects that has a looper in it, happy days, because that can get you out of trouble. So I used to do things like, isn't she lovely? Stuff like that, and kind of loop a few things around. And what, it, what you can do is you can have a solo melody arrangement, and then maybe you go into the chords and just sort of loop those around a little bit. And then you can just sort of take a bit of a solo, switch the looper off, and then, you know, do your chord melody bit out. And then it's like a, you know, it's more complete performance. And it covers more time is the thing, you know what I mean? As long as you don't sit there playing the same song for about 15, 20 minutes, you know, no one's really gonna notice 
to be fair. Now and again, you get someone asking for a request and it's like, mm, right, okay, mm. you know, if you know it, you know it, if you don't, you don't. Um, but yeah, definitely trying to get something like that together, I think, half an hour to an hour, handful of tunes that you could pull out of the bag if you needed to. I think that covers most of the roles. Um, you've got the production shows, you've got kind of function band kind of stuff, you've got live band karaoke, you've got jazz sets, more improv stuff, you've got big band kind of dance sets. Um, now and again, you might get asked to do like a, a small thing where you get, you know, you go outside and you just do like a little couple of tunes for a little event, but it, was, it still kind of tends to be under the, the sort of function wedding kind of material, really. I think that's probably most of the stuff, but as I said, anything stylistically you've got will come up. So some of the shows, some of the fun function, sh uh, some of the theatre shows will kind of be themed. So there's a couple of ships I was on where they had like a country show, especially the one out of Alabama. There's like a country show on there. So any kind of country chops or whatever, you know, there's a couple of solos that I actually learned off the track because after you've played it a few times, you really want to, something to keep it interesting. So I was like, right, I'm going to learn this solo that's on there note for note. You don't need to play it because it's on the track, but you know, so anything stylistically will pretty much get used. Yeah, and then the solo set thing, you know, that's pretty much everything you'll be doing. And perhaps some other things at this point. If you sing as well, you know, and you can play and sing, maybe they'll go, oh, cool, you know, can you go and, if you really want to do that, you can go and maybe do a set and cover one of the, the bar guys that's just doing singing or the piano bar guy. You know, you can just go, oh, we've got a special guest and you can go and do half an hour there or whatever. Anything you've got will get used. That's kind of all the, the sort of musical sort of stuff taken care of. Living conditions and just what it's like to be out there at sea and doing this thing for, for that amount of time. Most of the time, you will be probably only playing in the evenings. If it's a port day, so as in the ship is in is docked in port, so you know, you join in one place, maybe you stop in Rome or whatever. Everyone will be getting off the ship to go and see Rome. And there's some people that just never get off, which I find odd. You know, you pay all that money and then you just stay on the ship and eat the food. It's like. Strange. So yeah, in a, in a port day, you'll definitely only be playing in the evening. So you can get off the ship. You know, you can get off the ship, you can go and see Rome, you can see Venice, you can see wherever. I've seen, you know, a fair chunk of, of the world, or some of it anyway, some of the edges. I've seen some of the edges doing this kind of gig. And if you're in the entertainment department, especially in the bands, you're probably not playing until the evening. So you've, you can get off the ship early in the morning, have your day, come back, and then, you know, you play in the evening. It's, it's quite a nice life in that respect. In terms of where you stay, you will probably be in a shared cabin. It might be different now, but when I was on Carnival and Princess, definitely, I was in a shared cabin. And that's usually with someone else from the entertainment department. They kind of tend to put people in kind of little blocks so you're all on the same street, as it were, in the kind of depths of the ship. Probably won't have a window and it'll be air conditioning. So it's not the best living conditions and the rooms are quite small. Another reason to kind of pack light, really. You'll be sharing a room perhaps with either another band member or someone from the entertainment department, which can be good or bad. Depending on who you get, it is absolutely roommate roulette. You know, I've had some guys that, you know, have sort of become life, lifelong friends, really, from around the world. You know, I could sort of hit up any one of them on, online now and be like, oh, man, how's it going? And uh, if I was in an area where they were, I could go meet up. It's, you know, you do sort of bond in that way. But... I've also had a couple of situations where, you know, perhaps you end up rooming with somebody that has completely different hours than you just through an administrative thing. Maybe they don't have enough rooms. That can cause issues. I, I, one time I got roomed with a DJ who had sleep apnea. He was, so he was a DJ, so he would be working quite late and our sort of times didn't quite line up. But when we were in both in the room and it was time to sleep, I was on the top bunk. I think he was on the bottom bunk. And sleep apnea is basically from what I understand anyway, is uh, when your throat kind of closes up when you sleep. So I'd be there, you know, trying to get some Zs after a hard day of uh, playing solo melody Beatles tunes. And then this DJ guy would sort of be snoring, you know, fairly heavily. And then you hear this kind of like that, and this kind of clo closed air suction kind of sound, and then silence. And then the longer the silence, the bigger the payoff. So I'm there sleeping and I'm like, he's dead. This, this man, there's a dead man in my room. He has died in his sleep. And then <laughs> this unholy kind of glottal release, if you will. Like when a bus stops next to you and just goes right in your ear. So in that case, I was probably sleeping three hours a night 
or something like that, or maybe even less, because I just could not handle it. And once you've done it and it's woken you up, as soon as that cycle starts and you get the, I just couldn't sleep, just like anxiety. In that case, I really put the thing forward and got asked to, to move. And the guy who actually was really good about it and said, look, I know this is an issue. I've had other, you know, other roommates that have had the same thing. So he fought my case. In that case, Either you know, you've got issues like that or you're just so annoying that people don't want to share a room with you that you get your own room. How is that fair? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, as far as the room thing goes, you know, you will you will be that. You'll have a shower and a toilet, a small, think of like a really small hotel and like a little kind of triangle. I think at one ship I had uh, a toilet, which was like a, it's like a toilet, but the shower's up here. Uh, and it was like between, so there was a, my, my room here, a door here going to the toilet another door, and then the other room on this side. So somebody stayed here, I was here. So it was a shared, a, a communal toilet between two people. And that room was quite small in that the bed sort of was like a desk and then the bed pulled down over the top. So if you're gonna sleep, you pull, the, you pull the sort of bed down on the wall and then you get up and get in, you know, to sleep. And then when you're not sleeping, you have to kind of put it back up. So KG living conditions uh, on some of them. If you are lucky enough to end up being like musical director um, or you're just lucky, maybe you'll get your own room, but People sort of in charge, like music music director, musical directors, like dance captains, uh, cruise directors, officers, those kind of things, medical staff. They tend to get their own rooms, usually with a window as well. You do not under you know don't underestimate being able a window. <laughs> and you, you know I've never neglected a window again in my life because it's just you know you're just indoors all the time when you're kind of at sea. I would say because it is quite an enclosed environment, the highs are high and the lows are low kind of thing. Everything is kind of accentuated because you're in a little bubble. The social interactions are kind of like that because it is like you know the people that are on there that you're working with. That's just who you've got, and you can't really go anywhere. You can go to the crew bar. Maybe if you go upstairs, you have to wear a certain attire. There's certain places that you're not allowed to go. A lot of rules. Food, uh, you don't have to pay for any food or drink from the sort of crew mess. If you're in a certain department, you can go upstairs to the guest areas and eat, but usually at certain times, you know, if you work in entertainment, maybe you can go to like the sandwich bar or the pizza place or a certain buffet at certain times. Obviously, you know, a lot of, things, a lot of times you can't just rock up there prime time when all the paying guests uh, having their food. You have to kind of wait for certain times to do that. But the crew mess has certain times as breakfast and it used to be that you can order certain things as well. The food wasn't that bad. Day to day, it's, it sort of depends, but you know, for, in the entertainment department, you're kind of all right, it's not too bad. The big danger is the crew bar. So that is a bar in crew areas, usually kind of at the back of the ship, but lower down. So you can go outside to the back of the ship. And there's usually a sort of crew area there. And that's sort of semi hidden away from the guest areas. From when I was there, something like a beer, like a bottle of Corona or a Blue Moon or those kind of things were about 75 cents a bottle. So less than a dollar for a drink. Now, as you can probably imagine a bunch of musicians or just people out to sea anyway and you're offering them you know a beer for 75 cents so like you know around i mean i don't know what it is now but at the time it was like around a pound maybe less could cause some issues so if you are somebody that struggles with the drink thing be very wary about that i think the first contract i've probably spent every night for like six months drinking a little bit or a lot of it but you very quickly kind of grow out of that but like I say, the highs are highs and the lows are low, and sometimes there's not that much to do. So you just go to the crew bar out of habit. So it's like going to the pub every night. Now, if you're kind of, uh, if you've got decent willpower, you can go and just hang out and not drink, or just have a soft drink or whatever. But when it's there and it's so cheap and it's so easy to get a hold of, yeah, that could be an issue. But on the flip side, it's the place where all the sort of bonding happens. It's a place where weirdly, you know, you've got a ship that has like 70 plus different nationalities you get to the crew bar and people tend to sort of not in any specific like for any reason but sort of stick to their own so you'll get all the kind of entertainment people hanging out you get all the kind of room stewards and stuff hanging out you get all the officers hanging out you get the 
the medical people hanging out or the photo, photo staff hanging out. Perhaps language barrier, uh, perhaps just like a cultural thing as well. You do get mixing and stuff like that, but entertainment staff tends to be mostly guys from the UK, America, Canada. A lot of the time anyway, mainly English is a first language kind of place just because of the, you know, the people that, that they're speaking to a lot of times on these things and it just sort of common tongue, I guess, like, you know, for Game of Thrones sort of thing. But being surrounded by that many different people from that many different places, it's such a nice thing because it's like cultures and things that I never would have learned about. There's people from different places that you know you can sort of mix with and, and speak to. And it's I live in Manchester in the UK. How often am I, am I going to bump into a guy from the Philippines with like a story to tell? You know, one of my favourite stories: staying up to like 4 a.m. in the crew bar, playing November Rain on ukulele with a load of um, Filipino room stewards, just like smashing it out. Such a good time. Such a good time. And those guys would have been up like two hours later. Absolute mad lads. So yeah, in that regards, in that regards, it's great. As far as the pay goes, I tell you what, I can't actually remember. I feel like at the time it might have been about $2,800 a month, maybe, which, you know, dollars, it doesn't feel like real money to me anyway when I'm out there. If you take into account that you don't have to pay for any accommodation, you don't really have to pay for any food or drink if you don't want to. If you wanted to, you could just not get off the ship ever and just save all your money, you know, do a six month contract and then just come back with a big chunk of money. Obviously, if you did that, it would probably affect your mental health, but that's an option there. If, you, if you're that disciplined and you can maybe just handle living frugally, maybe getting off the ship and just going in a cap, sitting in a cafe, getting one coffee and reading a book or something, you could potentially do that. Um, that's one thing actually, contract lengths. When I, the first one I did, I think was nine months because I was just like, if I'm doing it, I'm doing it. They tend to be six months or four months-ish standard, I guess. If you've done it for quite a bit and you your agency will vouch for you, so they know you can just turn up, nail the job, no fuss. You can potentially do emergency contracts where it might you might be covering somebody for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. So you can just go out there, do it, and then come back. However, that being said, you still have to have your medical and stuff in check. You know, if, you, if you're going to do an emergency contract, you don't want to be like going out there to do just a little four week stint, but then paying for the medical, because it's, you know, it's almost kind of going to balance out to somewhat, you're going to lose half your pay just sort of, sort of the medical thing. But once you're in the system, so that's, you know, that's something else you could do. If you wanted to, you could just probably sign up and go bang, 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 and just work, work, work. I would recommend this kind of job. Perhaps, perhaps to the younger guy, maybe, like I did it a year out of university, and it was like a really good way of just letting the tires hit the road kind of thing. You know, it was all this stuff that I learned about in university, all this sort of work and you know you're trying to get your chops up and you're really hungry for different kind of different experiences you go out there you play it every single night it's always a variety it's very difficult to do that in the uk and in the current sort of climate i guess you know that sort of variety shows and not you know you'd have to really graft i think to be able to get that kind of variety on land as they say being able to go out there and have play every night meet all these different people I met some amazing musicians doing it as well like some of the people you might bump into will be absolute killers absolutely frightening because of the nature of the, the living conditions and stuff it could be tricky for like if you're sort of an older guy if you've got a family at home and stuff like that obviously you're going to be away perhaps a good one for the younger guys you could just do it bang 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 do a lot of uh, different contracts i think they used to have some sort of reward system like 10 year service without certain breaks in between you know you get some sort of payout almost like a sort of pension or something so that's a lot of stuff. I think that's probably, you know, without going into super like personal stories of experiences that happened, like super, super story time. I think that's probably most of the things you might want to know about in terms of the gig, you know, what's involved, how you do it. Would I do it again? I think now, because I'm somewhat set up at home, like when I stopped doing it, this is an interesting part as well, if you're thinking about doing this thing, when I stopped doing it, I would probably still bump into people that I hadn't seen for a while, two, three years later, and they'd ask like, oh, you know, how, when are you going back on the next ship? And it's like, I've not done it for, I've not done that for two years, man. But they just assume that you're in the sea. So as far as gigs go, once you're out there, people might go, oh, that's what he's doing. And you can't really, stop doing it and then i mean maybe you can but it's a bit weird to sort of put a post out online and be like hey guys you know guess who's back i know you miss me sort of thing um so if you go away be prepared that some of the land contacts you know some of the gigs on land it's very difficult to go away for like four or five six months and then just come back and land you know slot back into the gigs that you were doing so there's that for now i don't think i could go away and do it and give up all the sort of somewhat stable stuff that i've built on land to do it again. However, 
I would potentially do it if it was a short contract and it was maybe with a group. So you're not going out there on your own, going out there with a little band or a little act, a little trio, a little, you know, a little four piece or something, or a little wedding band situation, whatever, party band. Um, that could be quite fun. If it's a short stint, you know you're only there for a little bit and you're in good company, so you've got that safety, you've got that base, you know, you probably share a room with somebody that you know, as opposed to going out there and not knowing what's going on and then just sort of sinking or, sinking or swimming, as it were, uh, when you get there. As far as, you know, maybe what did I learn? I learned loads, man, like loads, because I say I was coming out of university, so you're playing every night, you know, and if you're trying to do the jazz thing, you've got these jazz sets and you can even call tunes if you want. So if you, there's a particular thing that you're working on, you can be like, all oh, right, can we do this? And then, you know, you can sort of have a go at it. I think the piano player called Giant Steps once, it's just like, oh. Man, why you do this? Why you do this? But I learned loads in terms of playing because you're just playing every single night so your chops will just be there, your time and stuff will be there. If you're studious and you're trying to get better, you will get better because you're playing every night and there's a reason to practice because you are playing every night. You know, there's a vehicle for all this, potentially all the stuff that you're working on. And also played with some amazing musicians. You know, a lot of the time, you get these kind of old pros from all around the world sort of doing the cruise ship thing for a little bit. Really, really good players. And they've also, obviously, you know, I joined the ship at 20, I think I was 23, and I had a roommate uh, called Larry, who's a sax player, sax clarinet. Amazing musician, guy from, I think he's from New Orleans. Yeah, sort of in his 60s, I think. Super sense of humour, really good musician, always up for like chatting music and chatting ideas and stuff. And if I go like, oh, you know, how, how do you go about this as a sax player? You know, you can ask questions with the right person, as long as it's not a super dark show band jazz guy that's like, get away from me, I'm not gonna tell you anything. You know, you can learn stuff off these different guys, which is, which is amazing. A few guys that were on kind of semester breaks from jazz college. So that was interesting to hear about the kind of American jazz uh, college slash university experience, which is obviously quite different to the UK in uh, some regards. Or I think there's more places in America that do that kind of thing. So all these different characters, you know, you can ask questions, you get to, to play music with these guys sort of every single night and you will absorb some of that kind of stuff by osmosis, if you like. Especially when it comes to the sort of jazz and improvisation stuff, there'll be people that are doing stuff and you're like, all oh, right, cool, or little tells or little things that guys do and in order to play with them in these jazz settings, you kind of have to know what those are so that when that thing happens, you go, oh, he's doing that thing. And then, you, you, you know, you learn like a new trick or a new thing. Loads to be learned, really. You know, straight out of university, playing every night, bang, 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 bang. My time feel and uh, my kind of hunger was probably the highest it was at during that time because you are just playing every single night. So... At this point, this is probably a fairly fairly long video, but I hope that's covered all these different things. Any questions, put them in the comments. Um, I'll, you know, maybe I'll do a video on the on the strat, the, the strat that got me through the cruise ship gig uh, at some point, so you can kind of see what's going on with that. And um, yeah, uh, you know, if you're into this kind of thing, or you have any more requests, subscribe, leave a comment, uh, hit the bell, all that kind of stuff, and uh, I'll see you in a bit.